those of the ways that you practice Sabbath. Um, we'll continue to see those during our time to breathe throughout the season of life. Would you join me in prayer? <clears throat> May the words of my mouth and the meditation of each heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Sometimes a name outlives a person. Elvis has left the building, used to be announced at the end of Elvis Presley concerts, to encourage his hysterical fans to accept the fact that there would be no further performance. It was, in fact, time to go home. The first known use of Elvis has left the building was printed in the Detroit Times in November of 1956. Presley gave his guitar a final bang, flung it from his shoulder, and fled the stage seconds ahead of the mob. Outside, a car waited with door open and motor running. By this time, his press agent, Oscar Davis, was on the stage. He grabbed the microphone and yelled, Elvis has left the building! Hold it, hold it, Elvis is gone! Now, we say, Elvis has left the building, more widely to indicate that someone has made their exit or that something is now complete. Elementary, my dear Watson, <laughs> is the supposed explanation that Sherlock Holmes gave to his assistant, Dr. Watson, when explaining deductions he had made. Now, interestingly, that line doesn't actually appear in the Conan Doyle book. It only makes its appearance later in the Sherlock Holmes film. So a name we now invoke when we are explaining something basic to someone is really based on the best known phrase that Sherlock Holmes never actually said. <laughs> the phrase was first used in a publication in 1915. A good Samaritan is someone who helps another in need for compassionate motives with no thought of reward after them. This one might be accepted. Although I think I would rather be called a good Samaritan than a Nicodemite. Nicodemus was a member of the Sanhedrin, the ruling council in Jerusalem, who was at least a little bit sympathetic to Jesus. Nicodemus is a Greek name that means the people's victory. Nicodemus, as Daniel explained to our kids, was identified as a Pharisee. Now at that time, during Jesus' lifetime, about two-thirds of the Sanhedrin uh, would have been Sadducees, and about one-third would have been Pharisees. So in other words, Nicodemus uh, was part of the minority faction within the Sanhedrin. Although by the time John's Gospel was actually written down 60 years later, um, there were no more Sadducees. The Sanhedrin was 100% Pharisees. Nicodemus was considered a leader of the Judeans, which places him firmly in the camp of those who were opposed to Jesus. In the fourth gospel, a Judean frame of mind represents temple corruption and divide and conquer attitude, setting Samaritans against Jews, for example. More on that next week when we hear the story of the woman at the well. If there was to be support for Jesus in the Sanhedrin, however, it would not be surprising for that support to come from someone who identified as a Pharisee. Jesus had much more in common with the Pharisees than with the upper class Sadducees. No doubt, some Pharisees were feeling kind of torn between the people-based, but risky, Jesus movement and the corrupt, but safer status quo. So what is Nicodemus's legacy? How does his name live on? Well, let's introduce you to him, and we'll find out. Jesus is meeting him for the first time, too. There was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, 
a Jewish leader. You can follow along in your bulletin. Nicodemus came to Jesus at night and said to him, Rabbi, we know you are a teacher who has come from God, but no one could do these miraculous signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered, I assure you, unless someone is born anew, it's not possible to see God's kingdom. How is this possible for an adult to be born? It's impossible to enter the mother's womb for a second time and be born, isn't it? I assure you, unless someone is born of water and the spirit, it's not possible to enter God's kingdom. Whatever is born of the flesh is flesh, and whatever is born of the spirit is spirit. Don't be surprised that I said to you, you must be born anew. God's spirit blows wherever it wishes. You hear its sound, but you don't know where it comes from or where it's going. It's the same with everyone who's born of the spirit. How are these things possible? You are a teacher of Israel and you don't know these things? I assure you that we speak about what we know and testify about what we have seen, but you don't receive our testimony. If I have told you about earthly things and you don't believe, how will you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has gone up to heaven except the one who came down from heaven, the human one. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so must the human one be lifted up so that everyone who believes in him will have eternal life. God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him won't perish but will have eternal life. God didn't send his son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. This is the basis for judgment. The light came into the world, and people love darkness more than the light, for their actions are evil. All who do wicked things hate the light and don't come to the light for fear that their actions will be exposed to the light. Whoever does the truth comes to the light so that it can be seen that their actions were done in God. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Well, John of Patmos writes seven letters to the churches in Asia. We call that the book of Revelation, the last book of the Bible that has been the subject of endless speculation in both theological circles and pop culture ones. John of Patmos warned his listeners to beware of the Nicolaitans. Nicolaitans were Christians who were willing to offer worship to pagan and Roman gods in order to remain unnoticed, if not tolerated in a non-Christian world. Much later in the 16th century, John Calvin referred to those who sympathized with the movement for the reform of the church but were reluctant to be publicly identified with it flying under the radar, if you will, he referred to them as Nicodemites. I also read this week that in the midst of National Socialism, Nicodemus' heirs, the German Christians, sought to accommodate the gospel to the racism and anti-Semitism of Nazi ideology. In response, the Confessing Church in May of 1934 declared, as Jesus Christ is God's assurance of the forgiveness of all our sins, so in the same way and with the same seriousness, he is also God's mighty claim upon our whole lives. So yeah, as many times as Nicodemus' name has been invoked since his life, I would say his name has outlived him. Although maybe not in the way Nicodemus would want to be associated with. I wonder, though, if Nicodemus' name might be redeemed by us today. I wonder if the fact that Nicodemus asked Jesus a bunch of questions 
under the cover of night, which Jesus responds to with a little rabbinical irony instead of divine judgment. I wonder if those questions are worth revisiting here and now in the light of day. Nicodemus reminds us that even the brightest and most educated among us are still searching. Not only do we not have all the answers, sometimes we don't even know what questions to ask. What questions would you ask Jesus? But here's the beauty of our faith. We are each and every one theologians. Theology literally means God talk. And each and every one of us, by virtue of being created by God, in the image of God, has the capacity to talk about God. No sense in leaving that just to the people with the fancy sounding titles and the thick books and long articles. Nicodemus gives us that permission. A person in power a religious leader, someone who is expected to have all the answers and to show others the way is here instead asking the questions. Now, in case this sermon ever gets into the hands of one of my seminary professors, I want to be clear. There is value in theological education and being <laughs> theologically trained. Because with our training, we can help others feel empowered in their own ability to make sense of the world through the lens of God. I you'll notice that Jesus didn't have any trouble uh, leaving Nicodemus muddled and confused. Jesus wasn't in any hurry to get Nicodemus uh, to sign on the dotted line to say, yes, I am here to follow you. Instead, Jesus says the spirit blows where it chooses. The spirit cannot be caged. It cannot be contained. Which means that the journey of faith and the workings of the world's salvation cannot be contained or caged either. When we speak of God's kingdom, Debbie Thomas writes, we are in a realm of deep mystery. It's okay to be surprised. It's okay to be stricken. It's okay to take our time. In her 2013 book, Christianity After Religion, historian Diana Butler Bass points out that the English word believe comes from the German word believen. In German, believen means love. And so Thomas explains, to believe is not to hold an opinion. To believe is to treasure, to hold something beloved, to give our hearts over without reservation. To believe in something is to invest our love in it. That's so good. I didn't come up with it. That's why I can say that, but I'm going to say it again. To believe is not to hold an opinion. To believe is to treasure, to hold something beloved, to give our hearts over without reservation. To believe in something is to invest in it with our love. In John's gospel, being born from above and believing in Jesus are not so much about what does with one's mind, it's about what we do with our hearts, with our lives. Those who do what is true come to the light so that it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God, Jesus says. In John's gospel, believing and doing are inseparable. As Mumford and Sons <coughs> sing, where you invest your love, you invest your life. Well, Nicodemus hovers on the margins and on the margins and in the shadows of John's story. He is, is slow to invest and he is quick to slip away. Of course, he's neither the first in the church nor will he be the last to follow Jesus from afar. 
from a safe distance. Now, to, to Nicodemus' credit, there is no doubt it would have been difficult, if not downright dangerous, for Nicodemus to follow Jesus publicly during the light of day. We can't forget that Nicodemus in this story represents the religious establishment. At first, they seem to just be a, a nuisance to Jesus, but later on, they really became a political problem and a threat. But we should remember this too about Nicodemus. Nicodemus shows up two more times in John's Gospel. The first time, he is interceding for Jesus to the other Pharisees. And then, when Jesus is crucified on the cross, Nicodemus shows up again as the secret disciple. With Joseph of Arimathea, he takes spices and helps bury Jesus. Here again, John identifies Nicodemus as one who came to Jesus in the night. There's something to be said, isn't there? For the people who show up when it matters. Nicodemus didn't just approach Jesus in the night to ask him questions that he was too afraid to ask during the day. Nicodemus also showed up during some of Jesus' darkest hours, before the light of resurrection was known and shone brightly. Nicodemus might have been on the wrong side of history on Friday when Jesus was crucified, but Nicodemus also sat with Jesus' body in the shadows of Saturday when the rest of the story was yet unknown. So maybe, maybe we too can show up for each other in these uncertain times and places, even when it's risky, even when it might come at a cost, even when part of our own identity and understanding might be challenged <coughs> for the sake of solidarity and love. We are meant to shine in the light. This is the world Jesus came to save. This is the world God so loves.